Hey, welcome to Never Sink Farm, and uh, this is the tomato webinar thing, and this is our prop house. And so this is where we start all of our tomatoes, and that would be certainly tip number one is to start them early, and the best way to do that is do them from transplant and pot them on. So I'm going to show you what I use to do that. So not only do you want to start them indoors and get them as big as possible, grafting is incredibly important. I graft, use any tray you want. This happens to be a windstrip tray, uh, which a windstrip is just about having good airflow, right? You see there's a lot of airflow in it and the rootstock in here and then just uh, graft onto these. You can also start everything in these trays and then just pot on to these, the rootstock that you want to use. You can do that too. That's really no big deal. Now after they are grafted and they've been healed in a healing chamber, then you want to pot them on. And tomatoes love being pot on. And so I pot them on into a four inch pot. Now you can pot them on into bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's all gonna depend on how much room you have. But the more you can pot them on, the earlier your tomatoes are gonna be because you're getting them nice and big before you put them in the ground. And if you're doing it outside, then you know, you wanna get them as big as you can. But it just comes down to space, right? So potting on really, really important. And having a place where you're gonna get lots of light in the winter, it's hard to do tomatoes on the windowsill because they start demanding so much light. So having a place to do it, potting them on, and also grafting. So now we're gonna go over to the place where I grow them indoors, and we'll take a look at that. We can also talk about variety. All right, so here we are in the in the uh, grow house where I grow the tomatoes and it's just, you know, it's a hoop house. We're growing them in soil. There's no plastic mulch. And today is May 8th, right? So May 8th and you can see six feet tall. And the reason they're growing fast and they're so big this early is about getting them in the ground early, getting a good start, getting something that's been potted on and has good vigor and potting it on at the right time. And so I start my tomatoes in early February and then I'm getting them into the ground this year I got them in the ground on March 14th. So I think these were March 14th, and then these may have been March 15th or 16th into the ground. And before we do that, we wanna really prep the soil well, not only well balanced with uh, all the right minerals, you know, all the way down to copper, boron, you know, that's a soil test. But also having a lot of organic matter, not only compost, but whatever your fertilizer regimen is, so if it's alfalfa or fish meal or feather meal, whatever it is that you use, the soil's got to be loaded up with them because tomatoes are a heavy feeder. And also early in the season, it's hard for them to pull up nutrients. So even though they're getting really, really well fed because there's not as much light, and the soil may not be up to temperature, it's still hard for them to get nutrients. So what you may wanna do, not only load up the soil with loads and loads of nutrients, is fertigate. You could fertigate them early in the season, and that's just sending some liquid fertilizer down. And that's usually gonna be uh, uh, fish juice. And that's gonna help them early to to get as many nutrients, but you don't have to do it. You can also use a zipper or make a trench and keep throwing in um, organic dry fertilizer into that trench 
and then just zip it back up. And, you know, as long as it's covered, it's going to break down pretty quickly and going to continue to feed the plant and to give it such good growth, right? Because you want very, very strong plants that are going to be able to produce, right? Nice and thick, uh, a thick stalk, big, broad leaves, very, very green. And all of that is going to reduce disease incredibly. Right? The, you know, the, when we get disease, it's usually from, you know, a lack of copper in the soil or some imbalance or, uh, you know, I have a problem with low potassium. So if there's not potassium in the soil, is a problem. But as long as the tomato has everything it needs and it has airflow, um, you know, there's air moving in here, it has the right temperature and food, it's really not going to get a lot of disease. So let me take a moment, we'll talk about uh, varieties. Uh, right here we have, uh, this is Big Dina. So this is a beefsteak, greenhouse beefsteak variety. And it just pumps out big, large red tomatoes that people love. And we moved to this uh, a couple years ago and we used to use a smaller uh, greenhouse variety, but these are nice and big, and people at the market, I, I really feel like they like the big ones. Not, not gigantic, but, you know, a good slicer, you know, where a nice slice covers the whole sandwich or burger or whatever they're going to have. And uh, surely Big Dina delivers. And Big Dina likes to be uh, put on a, uh, a rootstock to be grafted, and it, it just grows better that way. And... You know, it has anywhere from five to seven fruits per spur. Um, you know, and it, they're starting to really fruit now. You know, the early fruits will have less, maybe three to five, you know, for the first ones. And then they'll really start going and, you know, have tons per. And the other thing about Dina, they're very easy to trellis. And we'll go into trellising in a second, but they're just much easier than either an heirloom or one of the uh, heirloom hybrid types. And this is one of the hybrid uh, heirloom types, meaning it's taking um, many things from an heirloom, including taste and color and shape, and combining it with more vigor and more disease resistance. And there's you know, the three, Marnero, Margold, and Marbone. And Mar Marbone is the red one, and I think it's the worst of the three. And you may be better off substituting in like a brandy wine, because it's very much like a brandy wine, except the fruits don't seem to get as big. But the Margold and the Marbone are, are both very, very good hybrid, you know, off types. And I don't know which one this is, but this is one of those types. And you can see it's, it's grown as big as, if not bigger than the Big Dina already. They're not gonna produce as much as the Big Dina, but obviously you get more money for uh, one of these fruits than you can with this. And then we, then as we go down, we have uh, the Sakura, which the Sakura is, you know, one of the best cherry tomato varieties because it grows so well and just produces. I mean, it can produce three, you know, fruiting spurs on one spur, you know, you know, two feet long, just three of them. Just, it's amazing how much they can produce. And they only do that really when they're grafted. It's another one that really does well grafted. These, these heirloom, uh, hybrid types, they do better grafted, but it's not as uh, a big a difference as it like is with Sakura or Big Dina. And the Sakura we get, you know, they're going to be the earliest. They're going, they're probably just starting to ripen now, and so they'll be the first tomatoes we pull out of here. And early in the season, it's nice having just the red ones is fine, not a mix. And I don't want to waste space in here with too many cherries, so uh, we do a lot of 
Uh, you know, we do a mix later on. And we're gonna talk about that in a second on, you know, doing uh, multiple plantings. I use the clipper system, but you know, it's not like you have to use the clipper system, but trellising is incredibly important for production. Training things to a single leader not only increases uh, yield per square foot, but what it's also going to do is make everything easier. It's the plants are going to be healthier. It's going to be easier to harvest. Uh, you're going to have more sellable fruit. So it's just, I think, for high production, it's, it's a requirement to do it. And it can be very, very easy once you've been doing it a while. And the easiest is obviously inside a house where you can hang off either a wire or a pipe. And here I have it off a pipe. Uh, which is just, uh, I think it's three quarter inch uh, conduit, maybe half inch conduit, yeah, maybe half inch conduit. And uh, this clipper system, the difference between this and a roller hook situation is these slide down the, the metal uh, when they're lowered instead of lowering and adding string. And what that enables you to do is you only have two clips and you just keep leapfrogging the clips. But for the roller hook, you just add clips. You can also wrap it around, but it can start growing into the string and may cause a lot of problems. So you're better off clipping it. But so you're just adding clips as you go. And as it lowers, you're just getting longer and longer and adding clips. Uh, what this solves is now I no longer got to get on a ladder to lower everything and move them, right? I can lower them from here and then just move the clip, move the, not the clip, but the, the hook from the ground. And that makes things really, really easy. In the field, if you're doing it outside, right, you can still grab your tomatoes, get it early, pot on, uh, but your trellising is going to be different. You're either going to have to build uh, uh, somewhere to put either pipe or wire above it, which is difficult and it's a very heavy plant. There's a lot of tomatoes. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be stress on it. It can be done. Uh, the other thing you can do is just put stakes. Every, you know, you count three plants, put a stake, count three plants, put a stake, and you can just put the T-posts in. And then you use a Florida weave method where you're just going to go every 10 inches up the plant with string using a pipe to uh, direct it and wrap the plants in a weave and then when you come the next time 10 inches more you're just going to go the other way and you'll just keep doing that making like a basket weave holding the plants upright and you'll continue to prune uh, usually in the field people don't prune as hard but you can, you can continue to prune as hard in the field, but usually it's not done as meticulously as, as indoors. And that's because indoors, we're gonna get a 25, 30 foot plant that, you know, th because you know, we're gonna be growing for such a long season in here. And we wanna keep things to that single liter and keep everything very, very neat. Uh, So the basics of pruning and, you know, I, I can't go into, you know, in my course, I think it's like four half hour lessons just to prune, but I can give some basic idea. I really like the Johnny's pruner, those little tiny little ones. And one good tip on how to do it really fast is don't try to do everything at once. And what I mean by that is we also take bottom leaves off. We keep removing those up to the last place that we harvested. Uh, so, and that's one step. The other step is moving a clip or adding a clip. The other step is uh, removing suckers. And another step is lowering. And so when I come to a plant, I don't want to do all four of those steps on that plant. It's better to Remove all the leaves, 
and do the whole row. And then come back and add a clip. Then come back and do the suckers. Then come back and lower. It's just faster and more efficient to do just one step down because then I'm just clip, clip, and move, right? Clip, clip, move, right? Or I just move the clip, move the clip. And I'm not switching back and forth between tools or and my brain's not switching back and forth between different tasks that require a different skill set. So that's going to make things much faster and much easier. <clears throat> now, the biggest tip I can give for harvesting so that things are easy and efficient and productive is only harvest when it's blushing. Don't wait until you have a fully ripe tomato. The tomato, once it starts to blush, and it's going to start blushing on the bottom of the tomato, right, on the blossom end, right in the center. When that starts changing color, you can take it off. It has everything it needs to ripen. It's not going to change the flavor. Uh, it's going to be perfectly fine ripening in a tray. So just harvest all the blushing ones, put them in tomato trays. And tomato trays can be anything, you know, they could be, you know, it's nice to have them thin so they don't take up much room, but you can have them thicker, they'll just take up more room. And you're putting them blossom end up. And so that when you go through them before market, you can see what's ripe and then put them into the trays that are going to go to market. Just go through them and bring just the ripe ones and leave the rest to ripen fully. For cherry tomatoes, you have to get them pretty ripe. Not fully ripe, but, you know, we're talking about at least 70%, 60-70% ripe or they do have a bit of flavor difference and you don't want to be picking through cherry tomatoes to bring them to market. You just want to put them straight into pints and go. And for cherry tomatoes, a good tip is using the belly bucket. That helps a lot so that you can use both hands as you harvest them. Uh, I do the same thing with these, but for heirloom types, either real heirlooms or a hybrid heirloom, you're going to use a pair of clippers, and I use big Felco's F40, I don't remember which one, but the, you know, the grape snip ones. Uh, and that's to take off the stem. And this is another great tip is you never want to leave the stem on the big tomatoes because it dries out, becomes a little stabbing thing. And even if you keep your tomatoes in one layer at the market, people are going to mess them all up and they're going to start stabbing ripe tomatoes and be a mess. So I use those pruners to just clip out the heirloom ones. For beefsteak varieties, the stem is just gonna flick right off with the thumb. No big deal, easy peasy. Now at the end of the season, right, when you're getting near the end and you're not sure, and you know you're not gonna have a few more weeks left, you can start just cutting off the top and putting more energy into ripening the tomatoes that are there can even chop the roots with a shovel. And if worse comes to worse and the season's ending, you can just harvest all of the big green ones and do the same thing, ripen them in a tray for the next month and keep bringing them to market. And that's how we're able to bring tomatoes through and into December because we're just checking, you know, pulling them off of those trays. Not all of them ripen, not all of them last. You know, they're from a much older plant, but it's another way to raise production. All right, so successions. I only do two successions. I'll do one early indoor crop inside here, which is heated. And just a little note on heating. Uh, you want to maintain about 72. You know, it's pretty warm. And you don't want to go below like 65 at night. Otherwise, you're just not going to get the production you want. So it, it takes a lot of heat to do it. But this is an early house, so we plant in here in mid-March. And then I'll do one more planting, which will be in the movable, which is more like just a covered area of the field. It really has very little insulation. The movable is kept open 24-7. So it has to be done after the last frost. So it's almost like a field tomato that I'm keeping the rain off of. 
and I have a nice structure in which to uh, trellis off of. And so that'll go on the ground. My last frost is like May 20th. I put them out a little early this year uh, by a couple of weeks, but it's been a warm spring, so I was able to do it. And what that does is now at the end of the season, I'm not so worried about taking the plants out of here, taking them down, maybe saving some of those green tomatoes and starting my winter crop early in September. And then those field tomatoes will bring me through the rest of the season. And at the end of the season, you know, everybody's got tomatoes, so I don't need as many, but I still want something to have on the table. And that provides a reasonable amount of tomatoes that bring me to the rest of the season. And now I still have my house open for all of that stuff that I want to plant for Thanksgiving, Christmas, that kind of stuff. So that's why I do the two. It also empties out the hoop house, the, the propagation house rather, early. Because, you know, once you pot onto four inch pots or bigger, you're taking up lots of tables. And this way, mid-March, I get it in there. And now the field crops will have space on the table that I can get those on there and the tomatoes aren't using up all that space. Mm -hmm.